All right, good morning, very, very good morning. We have a, uh, as Lee Strobel says, a great unexpected adventure. The Christian life is just exactly that. The Christian life is a great unexpected adventure. And one of the things Elva and I often talk about is that um, when our lives get hectic and things do and when things are not going our way and sometimes that happens, in fact many times that happens, and when, uh, when things are rough um, that we're on a journey and it's an adventure. This is, this is God's adventure for us. And he has a plan for each one of us in that adventure. And he has prepared all of us for that by giving us spiritual gifts, which we're studying on Wednesday night, by the way, uh, to, uh, to use us for his glory. And that's what this is. 1 Peter 3.15 says that we are to be prepared. That's a key word there, to be prepared to share our faith, to be prepared to give an answer. Essentially, it's, it's this, be prepared. I've got that turned off for the video I'm going to show in just a minute. Okay. okay. Um, be prepared to give an answer to anyone that asks you, a reason for the hope that is within you, and do this with gentleness and respect. That's our mandate. It, that mandate's not just given to preachers, it's given to every single Christian. That we are be prepared to give an answer to anyone that asks, a reason for the hope that's within us, and to do that with gentleness and respect. That's, that's what we saw out of Charleston, South Carolina this morning, was just a, a tremendous response of gentleness and respect in the midst of real devastation. And it, it definitely hurts, yeah. Can somebody give Jim a mic? Uh, can give him. There you go. I, I was talking <clears throat> with another Christian about that particular verse, and she said that um, she didn't feel like she needed to witness to anybody unless they asked first. So how do you feel about that? Well, the the, the mandate for us is to uh, to realize every opening, and there there. The asking part of that, I think, is specifically there so that we will, we will not be abrasive and brutalize uh, you know, people in the, in the conversations that we have. And, that, and quite frankly, that's, that's something that apologists really need to hear because apologists have got a bad name for being uh, arrogant and abusive and that's not what we should be as Christians. And as the apologist mandate is 1 Peter 3.15, and it is said to do so with gentleness and respect. And so that's where, that's where we're to be. But, you know, an opening that God gives us uh, is, is an opportunity to ask a question. Not everybody will physically ask the question, but many times they will open the door uh, and give us an opportunity. And if we approach that with gentleness and respect, we will have... Uh, we will have the Holy Spirit move in and do his work in people's lives. But that preparedness is what I want to focus on this morning. This, um, the work of Christian apologetics is an interesting work because uh, you come into contact with all kinds of people. And there's people everywhere that near the, need to hear the word of Christ, need to hear the message of Christ. Uh, we're going to have a videotape this morning by a friend of mine by the name of Lee Strobel. And Lee's written a whole series of books that, call, that are called The Case For, The Case for Christ, The Case for the Resurrection, The Case for the Christian Faith. Uh, Lee started coming to the Christian Apologetic Conferences in Charlotte. They're, nas they're the National Apologetics Conferences in Charlotte every year. And um, we... We've become acquainted over the years, and it's always interesting to hear from Lee. Uh, just to give you some background, Lee was a devout atheist, uh, a very vocal atheist, and w enjoyed shutting Christians down. That was kind of a, a hobby. Uh, he, he enjoyed being the person that came in and just would shut you down by asking questions. And that's the reason we're told to be prepared. You know, we're, we're to be prepared 
to be able to give an answer. Uh, but Lee ran across some people that had some answers. And he started off, he's an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. That's, that was his job back in the days that he was an atheist. So he was used to investigative journalism. And so when this guy that presented Christ to him uh, told him there was evidence for the resurrection outside of the, outside of the Bible, he began to do an investigative report. He was going to prove to these Christians that they were wrong. And so uh, in the process of all of that, he gathered enough information that he went, wow, this, this is true. This is, this is not just a fiction. It's not just a figment of these people's imagination. It's not just a story. Uh, it's not just a fable or a myth. This is true. And so the truth of the gospel is what should, should uh, inspire us. Not, not, not a myth, not an idea, not just a, a thought or a fiction. Uh, not just a pleasant story to, to soothe our, our souls or make us comfortable. No, the truth. He said, the truth got me. And so then he goes on in this video we're going to watch and tells a few stories of how uh, in the midst of, of uh, his life, many times, you know, for us, we'll think, well, God, you sent me into this circumstance and, and I did what I thought I was supposed to do and it looks like nothing's happening. What's the deal? And he tells some of those stories, or at least one of those stories today. Let me say, just pre set this up for you. First, questions for Christians are healthy. It is not unhealthy for Christians to ask questions. It is not, uh, it is not an abuse of the faith for people to ask questions. Because listen, if our faith is true, if it is factual, then we ought to stand on the truth. We ought to be standing on the facts of the gospel. And if, we, if we're doing that, that's, that's evidence to people that we want to share our faith. And if we're not doing that, if we're just saying, well, they say, ask you why you believe, they say, well, I just have faith. You have faith in what? Why? Why do you have faith? Well, because my mama told me it was true, but, but why? I mean, I don't trust your mama. So tell me why I should believe. That's what they're really asking. Why should I believe? Uh, faith and science are not antithetical to one another. They are not contradictory to one another. And we should, we should understand that we as Christians ought to be embracing uh, investigation of the facts. And let me just lay the foundation for you. The more archaeological discoveries that are made, the more our faith is shown to be true. Over and over again. In the past, the past 50 years, well, let me, let me extend that just a little bit. In the past 100 years, there's been more evidence for the Christian faith unearthed than, than in, the, in the whole previous human history combined. And I think that is going to continue to escalate. And that what it's doing it is shutting the atheist scientist's mouth. They have to admit there's something more. And, he, and, we'll, and eventually, I hope that we'll get into some of this in, in this hour uh, to give us an opportunity to do, to do some things with regard to science. Uh, because science is unpacking a host of evidence that, that the Christian tr faith is true. And we need, we need to know what those things are so that when we talk to people and they go, well, the universe has just always been. Well, really? Is that right? It's always been. Well, do you know that most scientists today, even, even those who have no Christian faith about them at all, admit that there was a beginning to the universe? And here, here's the little syllogism. Anything that has a beginning has a cause. Anything that has a beginning has a cause. You look at the earth and all that's in it, this, this causal agent for this universe has to be outside of time and space because before this universe was created, there was no time and no space. He has to be all-powerful. He has, he has to be all the things that have the attributes shown for Jehovah God in the Word of God. And all of those things together point to the God of the Bible. And even those that have tried to come up with 
the steady state theory and the, all these different theories of how the universe could be without God come to an end. And, and in the last 10 years, just the last decade, over a dozen of those theories by scientists have fallen on their face. And they, there is no current uh, scientific theory that is embraced by, by atheist scientists that is, is, is common to them. For everything that has a beginning has a cause. The cause for in, this, in the case of the universe has to be powerful, has to, be, uh, has, to, has to have the attributes of the God of the Bible. He has, to, he has to be able to literally cause everything to come out of nothing. There has to be a causal agent outside of space and time that caused that, and that's the God of the Bible. That is who he is. Yeah, Jim. Um, Microphone again. Yeah, yeah. Microphone again. Microphone. There you go. I have a, a copy of a, a Bible called the Apologetics Bible, and in there, one of the questions that atheists ask is, well, who caused God? Yeah. But the answer would be, God doesn't have a beginning. That's right. There is no beginning. Yeah. You, you, you can't say, you cannot say everything has a cause that is. Everything that had a beginning has a cause. And so the beginning is the, is the big part of that there. God had no beginning. He's eternal. He's an eternal being. It's another point toward the existence of a holy God. Uh, I'm taking up too much time with that, but we're going to get into all of that eventually. Um, have you ever been talking to an unbelieving friend? Do you have any unbelieving friends? You should. Uh, have you ever been talking to an unbelieving friend and they ask you, are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? What would you say to them? Well, I've just always been a Christian. No, you haven't. By definition, you haven't always been a Christian. You had to make a decision at some point in your life to accept Christ. That's what makes you a Christian. Uh, why do you believe what you believe? Would be another question they might ask. Why do you believe that? Well, I've just kind of gone to church all my life, and I just kind of, you know, by osmosis, I just kind of believe that. Well, that's not an answer. And we're, we're commanded to be prepared to give an answer. That's what the word answer, the word answer there is the word apologia. That's where apologetics comes from, to give an answer for the hope that's within us. Could we say, could we say, I believe? Could we say, I believe, because of 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, you know, Jesus was seen. Yeah, absolutely. All, that's the whole list. That's an okay. evidence. And, and that's an evidence even outside of the biblical record there is record of those who said, hey, he, he was with me after the resurrection. Uh, there, so there's historical evidence there beyond the words of Scripture that, that point directly to Christ being who he is. Now, the reason I, I keep going beyond the word of Scripture because an atheist won't accept Scripture as being foundational, as being true. And, but, but historical evidence that would pass in a court of law should be evidence to that person. So, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a clear evidence of who, who Christ is. Uh, in those kind of situations, are you prepared to give an answer? Are you prepared to give an answer? So, we're going to watch Lee Strobel. Lee, again, atheist, uh, investigative reporter, investigated the, the, the truth claims of the Christian faith, made a decision for Christ, and then uh, became a pastor, as a matter of fact. And now he travels the world and... Yeah, yeah, and, and rejected all of that. He rejected it specifically because, and, and I got this straight from him, because they, people didn't have answers for him. He had no... They, they would give him a little uh, tippet answer, and he would go, well, what? And that nobody got to the real why of the issue. Give people an answer. That uh, yeah, and now he's written all kinds of books. But this is a really incredible, incredible journey. Uh, he's a wonderful man, and I think you'll enjoy the video. So let's let's get started. <laughs>
You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and then put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. What did Jesus mean by those words in Matthew chapter 5? I think he was saying, you know, if you're my follower, I, I, I want you to live lives that are, that are salty, that, that, that make people thirst for God. I want you to live lives that are like light, that, that shine my love and grace and forgiveness and, and message of redemption and hope, to, to shine that message into dark areas of despair. And the question I want to talk about today is, how do we do that in the 21st century? What does that look like? A buddy and I wrote a book about this recently, and we took a lot of time to title the book. And, and, because it was a very strategic title, we think. We, 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 we named our book, The Unexpected Adventure. Because we really are convinced that, that if four things are true of you, if you are motivated to talk with others about Jesus, if you make yourself available to do that, if you're prayerful, if you're prepared, you never know what's going to happen. Could start out an average and routine day, and yet God might open up an opportunity to have a spiritual conversation that could change someone's life in eternity. I've seen it time after time. I remember, you know, I lived this, unfortunately, wild life as an atheist for much of my life. Uh, came to faith, and then I was a, a, a pastor at a church outside Chicago. And so one day, one of our elders was there and one of our staff people, I said, hey, would you guys be interested in going downtown Chicago and I'll show you my old office and where I used to report on all the political corruption cases and all the crime syndicate cases in Chicago. They said, yeah, that'd be interesting. So we all went downtown Chicago, again, an average and routine day. And we go down to the federal courthouse where my office was in the press room on the fourth floor, on the 21st floor. So we're on the elevator, the elevator goes up, the doors of the elevator open, and right there in the corridor was a guy who used to be a competitor of mine from another news organization who I hadn't seen in all these years. And he's one of these tough Chicago reporters. You know, he's got the pork pie hat, he's got the cigar, you don't light it, you just gnaw on it all day long. You know. And the elevator doors open, and he sees me, he says, Strobel, how the blank are you, son of a blankety blankety blank? So the, I'm, I'm doing good. He said, I haven't seen you in years. Are you still writing for that blankety blankety Chicago Tribune, that blankety blankety piece of blankety blank? I said, well, actually, I've, I've had a big change in my life. I've, I've become a Christian, and I'm a pastor now. <laughs> and he looks at me. It was like the cigar almost fell out of his mouth. And all he could say was, well, I'll be damned. And I said, well, John, you don't have to be. And God gave me a chance to tell him about Jesus. I didn't expect it. It was an average and routine day. I didn't know I was going to get into a spiritual conversation with this guy I hadn't seen in years. That's the unexpected adventure of the Christian life. I mean, the, the, this, this raises the temperature of our entire Christian experience when we kind of live in those adventures, those unexpected adventures. I mean, it, it's, when our, it's when our worship takes on a whole new dimension because we're worshiping the God of the second chance who loves our spiritually confused friends even more than we do. It's when our Bible study takes on a whole new dimension because we're not just looking for abstract theological truths. We're looking for something that can help explain something to a friend of ours who's curious about God. It's when our prayer life takes on a whole new dimension because we're praying, God, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. You know, it's when our dependence on God is at the greatest because, you know, we know that apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing we can do to change someone's life in eternity. But this is where the, the unexpected adventure lies. And so I thought, you know, uh, how can we do this and live in that world? I, I imagine, well, what if Jesus physically lived in my house? What if he physically moved in? What would I learn from the master in terms of the way that he would interact and relate to all the neighbors? And so as I studied the life of Jesus, I found all kinds of things I would learn. You know, things about how he would pray for people who are spiritually confused. Things, how he would serve and put his love into action. There's lots of things. But there's two things in particular I want to focus on today. The first one is this. If Jesus 
physically lived in my house. I think he would let all the neighbors know that his door is always open for questions. Do you have a doubt? Do you have an objection? Do you have a hesitation about spiritual stuff? Hey, the door's open. Come, bring the Starbucks. Let's sit in the floor. Let's talk about this stuff. I, you know, because I can't think of any example in the New Testament where Jesus slam dunked anybody that came to him with a sincere question. Can you? In fact, my favorite example of that is, is John the Baptist. I mean, think of this. If anybody should have known the identity of Jesus being the unique Son of God, it was John the Baptist. He once pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He baptized Jesus. He, he, he saw the heavens open up. He heard the voice of the Father saying, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. John the Baptist once pointed to Jesus Christ and said, I have seen and I testify. This is the Son of God. But then what happens? He gets arrested. He gets thrown in prison. Question. What happens to almost all of us when tough times come? Doubts begin to creep in, don't they? And that's what happened to, to John. He's sitting there in prison. Now, all of a sudden, he's got hesitations. He's not quite convinced of the identity of Jesus anymore. And so he sends a couple of friends. He says, track Jesus down and just ask him point blank. Are you the one we've been waiting for? We'd wait for somebody else. So his buddies track Jesus down and say, hey, Jesus, you know, you know John. Well, he got busted. And he is freaking out. And now he's not so sure about you. So would you just tell us point blank, are you the one we've been waiting for, or are we to wait for somebody else? Now here's the issue. How does Jesus react to this? Does Jesus get angry? Does Jesus say, how dare John have the temerity to express a hesitation or a doubt about my identity? No. Jesus said to those followers of John in, in Luke 7, verse 22, go back to John and report to him what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead, are raised from the, uh, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. So in other words, go back to John, tell him about the evidence that you've seen with your own eyes that convinces you that I am the one I claim to be. So they go back and they tell John, but here's the deal. Has this little episode now poisoned John in the mind of Jesus? Is John now disqualified from any role in the kingdom of God because he dared to express a question? No. In fact, it's after this incident that, that Jesus got up before a group and he said, you know, among those born of women, there's no one greater than John. John the doubter. John the guy who asked a question. Friends, if you're a follower of Jesus, you've got to know something. It's okay to have questions. It's even okay to have some doubts and some hesitations as long as you do what John did, which is pursue answers. Right? I mean, there are good answers that satisfy our soul. Um, so if, you know, it's all right. And the worst thing you can do as a follower of Jesus, if you have doubts or questions that are, that are growing in your heart and soul, to just ignore that and because they become bigger and they fester and they will ultimately destroy your faith. But if you pursue the answers, you'll find that we do have answers to the toughest issues of life. And the other thing is, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're told in 1 Peter 3.15 that you always need to be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So we're told, you know what, we have friends who have spiritual questions. They're curious about spiritual matters. They're maybe confused about God. Many of them have spiritual sticking points. They're like they're on this journey, but they're hung up over a doubt or an objection that they can't quite get past. And the Bible says that's your opportunity to help them get past that um, point where they're stuck in their journey. Not that we have to be the Bible answer man, the Bible answer lady, and have every answer to every question on the tip of our tongue. No. Sometimes the very best thing we can say to our friend is, that's a great question. I have no idea how to answer it. But let's research it together. And it gives you a chance then to help walk them toward an answer. I'm glad there were people in my life 
when I was an atheist to help me find answers to the questions that were sticking points for me. There was a church like this one where it's open season. Come on in, ask your questions. Um, I had friends, scholars, experts that I went to because I was living at the time a very self-destructive life. I'm not saying all atheists do this, by the way, but I'm telling you what my life was like because I was a hedonist. I thought there's no God. What, I should just live a life of maximum pleasure. And so I lived a very immoral and drunken and profane and narcissistic and really self-destructive kind of a life. I mean, I, I was destroying my life. I was destroying my children's life. I mean, a lot of anger inside of me, a lot of rage. I remember once I, I, I blew up right in front of my daughter. It was a toddler, and I just kicked a hole through the living room wall out of just raw rage. And I mean, it got to the point where my little daughter, if she was alone in the living room playing with some toys, some blocks or something, and she would hear me come home from work through the front door, her natural reaction was to gather her toys and go in her room and shut the door. Is she going to be drunk again? She going to be yelling and screaming and, and kicking holes in the wall? You know what? At least it's nice and quiet in here. And that, friends, is the ugliest truth about me. That my wife, through a neighbor, became a Christian. And I began to see positive changes in her character and values and, and, and encouraged me to take my journalism training and legal training and investigate. Is there any credibility to this stuff? Does it add up? Are there answers to the toughest questions of life? And I spent two years of my life researching that. And we, I talked about the apologetics conference, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus that convinced me finally that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, but he backed it up by returning from the dead. And the historical data convinced me. And I remember that moment. And a verse came into my mind that a Christian friend had told me earlier. John 1.12 But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name. I believed because of the evidence, but I had to receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life. And when I did that, I would become a child of God. And so I prayed, I received Christ that day, and God was faithful because my life began to change. My values, my character, my morality, my relationships, my philosophy, my worldview, my parenting. I mean, all these things began to change for the good. So much so that uh, my little daughter, Allison, now think about this for a second. Here's a little kid, five years old at that point. All she knew was a dad who was absent, angry, kicking holes in walls, coming home drunk, bringing girls around. That's all she knew. But she started on that day I gave my life to Christ, over the following months, she started to watch and listen because something was going on. Something is changing with dad. And so she watched and she observed for five or six months and finally it was a Sunday morning. She went first to her Sunday school teacher and then to my wife Leslie. And you know what she said? I want God to do for me what he's done for daddy. And at age five, my little girl gave her life to Jesus. And today she's married to a seminary graduate. Together they write children's books about God. She is the mother of two of my three precious granddaughters. And we are the best of friends. Friends, God changed my life. But I had sticking points. I had to get past them. I had to resolve these issues, these questions, these doubts. And maybe you've got that. Maybe you've got sticking points this morning. And I would say to you, you know what? Pursue answers because guess what? God is already pursuing you. Why do you think you're here? But maybe you've got a friend and your friend has doubts. We can help them. We can get alongside them and say, I may not have the answer, but there's wonderful resources. Um, this apologetics conference we just did, and we got a million resources by uh, lots of different scholars out there. You can find something to help your friend. We owe it to them because we want to see their life change too. So I think if Jesus physically lived in my house, 
door would always be open for questions. The last thing I think, you know, if, if Jesus physically lived in my house, one thing I would notice as well would be how he would be authentic in the way in which he related to the neighbors. He'd be authentic. In other words, there'd be consistency between his beliefs and his behavior. Between his character and his creed. And the question is, what about us? What do people see? You know, if you're a Christian, I can virtually guarantee you that your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues at work, folks on the job site, wherever you are, they are scanning your life 24-7 with this hypocrisy radar. You know, right? You know they are. They're watching. They're listening. What are they looking for? You know, false piety. What are they looking for? Kind of a holier-than-thou attitude. What are they looking for? Someone that pastes on a phony Christian happy face and pretends like everything's always okay when you know it's not. What do they see? I got a letter a while back from a young woman, 24-year-old nurse by the name of Maggie. And Maggie uh, was poisoned against God and the church because when she was growing up, her hypocrisy radar was scanning the people in her life who claimed to be Christians. But wait a second. These were the same people who were abusing her when she was a child. And so it, 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 it turned her off against spiritual stuff, against God and so. I want to read you a bit of a letter I got from her because I think she sums it up so well. She said, Lee, the Christianity I grew up with was so confusing to me even as a child. People said one thing, but they did another. They appeared very spiritual in public, but in private, they were abusive. What they said and what they did never fit. There was such a discrepancy, so listen to this. I came to hate Christianity and did not want to be associated with the church. Friends, that is the power of inauthentic Christians to repel people from God. Um, you know, when Jesus said, I want you to be salt and light, he meant that in a positive way. But the ugly truth is, there are a lot of Christians who are like salt in a wound. You know? Or, or like headlights on a dark night that make people avert their eyes because of the glare. And that's what happened to Maggie. But then what? I'll tell you something funny. Maggie one day is reading the newspaper, Chicago Tribune. And she sees an article about a debate that was being held at a local church between a Christian and an atheist. Let me give you the background on this. Um, I was at the church in Chicago, and one of my friends at the time was the national spokesman for American Atheists Incorporated. He was a friend from my atheist days. And uh, so after I became a Christian, I would relate to my friend and spiritually try to get into spiritual conversations with him. And one day my friend said, you know, Strobel, you Christians are all alike. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, you'll, you'll give the case for Christ. You'll give the evidence for God. But you won't give the evidence then against God and then just let people make up their own mind. I said, oh, yeah? I said, I'll tell you what. You go get the smartest, the most articulate atheist on planet Earth and I will fly him here to our church and I will allow him to stand on the platform and proclaim the case for atheism but I'm going to get a Christian. And that Christian is going to present the case for Christ. Then he's going to debate your atheist and we'll just let people make up their own mind. He said, you wouldn't do that. I said, oh yeah? We shook hands on it? My very next thought was, man, I should have asked a senior pastor if this was all right. <laughs> Too late. This ball was rolling. Chicago Tribune did all these articles, talk radio, talk television. Why? Because the church said, we're not afraid to have an intellectual shootout to deal with these issues and explore them. I started to get phone calls from radio stations around the country. Hey, can we broadcast this thing live? Okay. Pretty soon we had 117 radio stations coast to coast. They're going to broadcast this thing live. One radio network sent commentators like it was a prize fight or something. There was a jab by the Christian. I think the atheists on the ropes. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. The night of the debate came, traffic was gridlocked within two miles of our church. 
we opened the doors. People ran down the aisles to get a seat. I mean, when's the last time you saw people run into a church? I mean, we had 7,776 people live in our auditorium and hooked up by video overflow on our campus. We had coast-to-coast radio about to go on the air. I'm the moderator. I'm nervous. I'm pacing backstage. And and one of our elders comes up to me and says, So, Lee, we are going to win this, aren't we? (laughs) So... So our Christian representative gets up. We chose, uh, maybe you know the name, William Lane Craig, who I consider to be the greatest defender of Christianity in the world. Uh, Two earned PhDs, great guy. He gets up. He gives the most powerful 20-minute summation of the evidence for the existence of God and the truth of Christianity that you have ever heard in your life. I wanted to cheer, but I was a moderator. I had to be neutral. Thank you, Dr. Craig. And now the atheist, Professor Zindler. Yeah, good luck, buddy. So this guy... They chose their guy. So he gets behind the podium. He's about to open his mouth, but we didn't tell him one thing. We didn't tell him that right where he was standing, underneath the platform was a room. And that room was filled for the entire two and a half hours of the debate with Christians who were praying that the case for Christ would go out with all this convicting power and the case for atheism would be recognized for the bankrupt philosophy that it is. And if you've seen the video of that debate, you, you go on YouTube and you can see it. Uh, God answered that prayer. We had people vote. What's your spiritual condition as you come in? Who won the debate? What's your spiritual condition as you leave? Initially, we took just the ballots of the atheists, the agnostics, the skeptics, just among those people, having heard the case for Christ and the case for atheism. Over 82% said the case for Christ was by far the most compelling, and 47 people walked in as confirmed atheists, heard both sides, and walked out as followers of Jesus Christ. Um, And... Not one person became an atheist. (laughs) I'm just saying, you know. Um, Now, am I saying, therefore, we all ought to go out debating people? No, I'm not a debater. You're probably not a debater. I think for us, the key word is relationships. It's dialogue. It's conversations. It's friendships where we can sit down and honestly discuss uh, spiritual sticking points and, and, and look for resolution to that as friends who do more empathizing than preaching, who do more listening than talking. Um, so here is Maggie, 24 year old nurse, poisoned against God in the church because of abuses in her childhood, reads in the Tribune about this uh, b- b- debate coming up. So she comes to our debate because she wanted to see the atheist triumph. Well, the atheist lost. The Christian won. So now she's full of, she doesn't know what to do. So she starts writing me these letters. Um, Dear Lee, um, you were the moderator of the debate. Here are my first ten reasons I don't believe in God. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, So, okay, I write back. Dear Maggie, thank you. Those are great questions. Here's my attempt to answer the first one. I thought this is ridiculous. So I called her up. I said, Maggie, um, you know, this is an inefficient way for you to get answers. I said, I think a relational kind of way is much better. We have little groups in our church led by a Christian couple with half a dozen people like you who are on a spiritual journey, who have questions and doubts. Why don't you join one of these groups and you can go on, you know, build some friendships and, and, and discuss your spiritual sticking points and, and work it out and so. She said, that'd be great. So Maggie joined one of these groups. And I want to read to you what she said about this group because Jesus told us to be salt and light. And sometimes I think we wonder, what does that mean? How does that, what does that look like? What are people looking for from us? And Maggie sum- summarizes it so well. She said, so when I came to church and to my small group, I needed, here's the first thing she needed. I needed gentleness. I needed to be able to ask any question. I needed to have my questions taken seriously. I needed to be treated with respect and validated. But most of all, listen to this, most of all, I just needed to see people whose actions match what they say. I'm not looking for perfect, but I am looking for real. Integrity is the word that comes to mind. I need to hear real people talk about real life, and I know if God is or can be a part of real life. Does he care about the wounds I have? Does he care that I need a place to live? Can I ever be a whole and a healthy person? Well, I've asked questions like these of the couple that lead my group, and I've not been laughed at or ignored or invalidated. I've not been pushed or pressured in any way. In fact, she said, I don't understand the caring I receive from the Christians who lead my group. I don't understand that they don't seem afraid of questions. They don't say things like, just have to have faith. You just need to pray more. 
They don't seem to be afraid to tell who they really are. They just seemed genuine. And then Maggie sent me a copy of a poem that she wrote for the two Christians that led her little group. And from the day I read this poem, I thought, no, 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 this is a, this is a poem that every follower of Jesus needs to hear. Why? Because this is the heart's cry of the very kind of person God has told us to be salt and light to. People poisoned against the church. People running the other way from the church. So I want you to listen to the words of this 24-year-old nurse and imagine she is looking you in the eye as a Christian and saying these words. Do you know? I mean, do you understand that you represent Jesus to me? I mean, do you know? Do you understand that when you treat me with gentleness, it raises the question in my mind, well, maybe he is gentle too. Maybe he isn't someone who laughs when I get hurt. I mean, do you know? I mean, do you understand that when you listen to my questions and you don't laugh, that I think, well, what if Jesus is interested in me too? I mean, do you know? I mean, do you understand that when I hear you talk honestly about arguments and conflicts and scars from your past, that I think, well, maybe I am just a regular person instead of a bad, no-good little girl who deserves abuse. If you care, then I think maybe he cares. And then there's this flame of hope that burns inside of me, and for a while, I'm afraid to breathe because it might go out. I mean, do you know? <laughs> do you understand that your words are his words? That your face is his face to someone like me? Please, be who you say you are. Please, God, don't let this be another trick. Please let it be real this time. Please. I mean, do you know? I mean, do you understand that you and you and you you represent Jesus to me. First time I read that, I cried. I did. I, you know why I cried? Because what flooded into my mind were, were all the times when I was not like Jesus to someone. I, I, I was too busy doing the work of professional clergy to give a rip about the spiritually confused neighbor that lived a five iron shot from my house. I said, this has got to stop. So I called Maggie up. I said, Maggie, Maggie thanks for that poem. I, I was very convicted by it. I said, I'm speaking at the church this week, and I want everybody to hear it. Can I get your permission to read it? She said, oh, Lee, haven't you heard? I said, uh-oh, what? Because I'm thinking now she's met some other inauthentic Christian who's pushed her away again. I said, no, Maggie, tell me what happened. She said, no, it's a good thing. I said, what? She said, on Tuesday night, I gave my life to Jesus. I said, Maggie, that's fantastic. The party's probably still going on in heaven. That's, that's great, but you've got to answer a question for me. You were so poisoned against God, so poisoned against the church. What brought you across the line of faith? What five facts did you learn that convinced you that Jesus really did rise from the dead? I said, it wasn't like that with me. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What ten facts did you learn that convinced you that the Bible is the word of God? She said, it wasn't like that with me. I said, well, then what was it? Well, now she's embarrassed. Now she kind of shrugs over the phone. She said, well, Lee, I just, I just met a whole bunch of people at church who were like Jesus to me. Said, what a lesson. What a lesson for me. You know, I'm the kind of guy who likes to pull, put pin somebody up against the wall. I'll give you ten reasons for the resurrection. Don't like those. I'll give you ten more. Now, think about it. Maggie went to the debate. She heard the evidence for Christianity. She saw it put to the test by an atheist. So she heard the evidence. But what did God use to bring her across the line of faith? A simple, loving um, couple, Christian couple loved her into the kingdom of God. And the good news of that is, guess what? We can do that. We can do that. We can pray for people. We can serve people in the name of Christ. We can open our doors and help them get answers to those spiritual sticking points. But the easiest thing of all is, we can be authentic. 
We can just be ourselves. We don't have to pretend we're smarter than we are or, or, or more godly than we are. We, we can just be sinners saved by grace. And God will take us on a series of unexpected adventures that will be the biggest joy in our lives. I've seen it time after time after time. And I'll just end with my favorite story of an unexpected adventure that happened to me one day when I was a new Christian and I was an editor of a newspaper in Chicago. It was an average and routine day. And I was packing my stuff up to go home. And I felt like God was, was kicking me in the butt, and real specifically, to go into the business office of the newspaper and invite my atheist friend to come to Easter services at our church because Easter was coming up. So I thought, this is great. If God is really leading me to do this so specifically, this is going to be spectacular. He's probably going to repent right there, get on his knees, receive Christ. This is going to be fantastic. So I, I walk over to the new business office with great anticipation. And I, I, I walk in, I look around, and all I see is my friend behind his desk. Perfect. So I said, hey, how you doing? He said, I'm doing great. I said, hey, you know, Easter's coming up. He said, Lee, I'm an atheist. I don't observe Easter. I said, yeah, 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 I know, but, but Easter's when we remember that Jesus rose from the dead. He said, oh, he did not. I said, well, actually, there is good historical evidence he did. And I began to talk to him about the evidence historically that Jesus rose from the dead. And I'm trying to get in a bunch of stuff, and, and you can see his eyes are glazing over. So I thought, okay, this isn't going well. So I, I said, I took another tact. I said, so um, do, you ever, do, you, do you ever think about God? He said, no. I said, okay. Um. I said, do you have any questions about God? He said, no. Okay. Um. Hey, look, I said, uh, you know, I know you like music. Our church has got great music. Why don't you come to Easter services? I think you'll like the music. He said, I don't want to go to your stupid church. Hey, okay, hey, um, thanks, um, I'll talk to you, you know where my office is, if you ever have a, a question, or, and I scurried out, and I thought, what the heck was that? Why did God tug me so specifically to go and invite him to church and talk about Jesus and the resurrection and so, when to this day, he's still an atheist? And I'm telling you, this bothered me for years. But I'll tell you now the rest of the story. Several years after that, by then I was a pastor at this church outside Chicago. I preached on a Sunday, and a guy came up to me and said, can I just shake your hand and thank you for the spiritual influence you've had on my life? I said, well, that's very nice. Who are you? He said, well, let me tell you my story. A few years ago, I lost my job, and I was panic-stricken. I didn't have any money in the bank. I was going to lose my house. I was going to lose my car. I didn't know what to do. I needed work. So I called a friend of mine that ran a newspaper, and I said, hey, do you have any odd jobs I can do to earn a buck at the newspaper? And the guy said, well, can you tile floors? And he said, well, yeah, I've tiled my bathroom. I think I can tile floors. The guy said, well, we need some tiling installed and repaired at the newspaper, so if you can do that, we can pay you for a while. Great. So he said, I went to work at the newspaper. He said, one day... An average day before Easter, I was in the business office of the newspaper. And I was on my hands and knees on the floor behind a desk working on some tile on the floor. And you walked in the door, and I don't even think you knew I was there. You start talking to this guy about God. You start talking about the resurrection. You start talking about the historical evidence that Jesus really did rise. You start inviting him to church. This guy was shutting you down. But I'm on my hands and knees behind this desk, and my heart's beating fast. I'm thinking, I need God. I need, I need to go to church. So... So he said, as soon as you left, I called my wife. I said, we're going to go to church this Easter. She said, what? I said, yeah. He said, we came to your church that Easter. I came to faith. My wife came to faith. And our teenage son came to faith. And I just wanted to thank you. And I thought, this is a new form of evangelism. Ricochet evangelism. <laughs> you, you share your faith. It bounces off a hard heart. You don't know where it's going to go. Friends, this is the unexpected adventure of the Christian life. You don't want to miss this. We can't do this in heaven. This is our one chance. So let's ask God to take us on these unexpected adventures. Because you know what? He's dying to. He wants you to. So let's pray. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and say, Lord, you know, this church reminds me of the city on the hill that Jesus referenced. A city that just shines your light of grace and hope far and wide. We pray for this church, for the leaders, for the volunteers, for everyone who's part of it here, that you would continue to use them. And I pray that you 
would minister to those who have doubts and questions to lead them to the truth of who you are and help us to help them uh, in a loving, gentle, and respectful way to resolve these issues that are like sticking points in their lives. Because we love you. You have changed our lives. And we know you want to change theirs too. Now, friends, what I want to do, just as their eyes are closed and heads are bowed, it just strikes me that maybe the Spirit of God has done something in your soul this morning because of the worship, because of what Ray said, because of something you've heard, whatever it is. Maybe God is opening up your heart even now. I'm going to offer a prayer. And if you want to do what I did on November the 8th of 1981, when I didn't just believe something, but I received forgiveness and eternal life through Jesus, if you don't know if you've ever done that, if you have doubts, then now's the time not to just believe, but to receive. So if you want to take that step, just in your heart, God will hear you. You don't have to even say it out loud. God will hear you. Say, Lord Jesus, it is true that I've fallen short of how you want me to live. I know that. I may not have been as bad as Strobel, but I know I haven't lived the kind of life that you would have me to live. I've sinned. I've fallen short. And so, Lord Jesus, right now, in repentance and faith, I want to turn and I want to receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that you purchased on the cross when you died as my substitute to pay for all of my sins, past, present, and future. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me so much. You were willing to die so that we could be united in this life and then in a perfect way in the world to come. Help me, Lord Jesus, to follow you closely because from this moment on, I am yours. Amen. All right. Well, let me um, let me tie some ends together. There, Lee is a, is a good friend, and he. He mentioned William Lane Craig. Uh, I had the opportunity to travel in South Africa with William Lane Craig. He and I spoke on the same circuit while we were there, and he debated a couple of Muslim scholars, which was just extraordinary. But he was talking about uh, how William Lane Craig did in this debate. I've never seen Craig do a debate that he wasn't extremely well prepared for. He spends months and months and months, normally six months, in, in preparation for a debate. People think, well, somebody just walks in and does something like that, but he, he was well prepared for the debates I saw. We were in uh, two debates there in South Africa where Craig debated this Muslim scholar, and he, we walked in. We were uh, one of uh, Elvin and I were, uh, no, Elvin, you weren't even with me then, were you? I, I, was, I was there alone. Uh, but there were only about ten of us that were Christians that were in that that were in there to hear the debate, and there was literally thousands of Muslims. And uh, William Lane Craig just did a masterful job that day, and just an, an amazing deal. So, um, being prepared to share our faith is a large part of this. Loving people to that place that they can are ready to hear and receive that information is another thing. But uh, I hope that you got a little taste of Lee Strobel. You like him? Incredible, isn't he? Uh, that's a taste of what Christian apologetics is all about. So I'm, I'm thankful that, uh, that you got a chance to hear, hear Lee. He's, a, he's an incredible guy. Uh, just very quickly, what time we got? 10.58. Okay, we're... We've got two minutes till the service starts, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this as we, as we close out. Uh, being prepared for those kind of opportunities is huge. It's a large part of who we are as Christians, to be prepared to, to take on those unexpected 
adventures. So I'm just encouraging you to be prepared. Uh, we'll, we'll get there and we'll, we'll continue this, this kind of a series where we have a chance in the future to open up for questions and answers at the end, which uh, I, I hope to be able to do very soon. God bless you. We'll see you in a minute and a half.